All right, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Once again, we thank Yah for the opportunity to be with you all today to discuss and spend time together to discuss His Word and um, to focus on the dietary laws once again. Today we're going to start um, or continue in part four, but we finished in part three last time, which is the church argument against the dietary laws. Uh, we spoke briefly on uh, Col- Colossians 2, 16 and 17 last time in part three, and we're going to go ahead and do a quick summary of those slides real quick just to connect the two lessons. All right, so let's go ahead and get started on part four, and I'll go ahead and get us started with rereading Colossians 2, 16, and 17 to examine the scriptures the church uses to justify their food choices. And this is Paul writing here, and we'll go over it. Like I said, this we already discussed this in part three, but we're going to um, just briefly mention it just to connect the two sections of the lesson. So let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Shabbat or Sabbath day, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Mashiach. So we last spoke on how holy day, even though the English translations put on the, put it as one word to make it look like holiday. Paul was referencing the holy days, the feast days. And you see that right there, right in front of our face. So Paul is specifically speaking of a feast day. Okay? And then he speaks of Sabbath days. And of new moons, which are a guide for Torah, to guide a guide in Torah for the changing of the months and seasons. And then he speaks of a shadow of things to come meaning they are just the beginning of what will be, and that a shadow mimics what cast it. Therefore, we do we are doing what our Messiah did, right? Because we are the body of the Messiah. Mm-hmm. All right? So he was speaking about things of Torah so far. So he said, let no man therefore judge you in your obedience to things in Torah. But then he ended the, his statement according to the English translation, but the body is of Mashiach. Okay, which doesn't really make sense. Why would he suddenly go from saying, we must, don't let anybody judge you in your obedience to Torah, in the various things, food and, and food and water or food and drink, in holy days or feast days, um, observing the new moons or the Sabbath days, which are shadow things to come. And then he ends up saying, the body is a fossil, right? Mm-hmm. That does not make sense. And we talked about that last time. So if you move to the next slide, here we speak on more of what he was saying as the body, so we can clarify what the body is. And we said that it was soma, the Greek word soma, and here it's defined as distinguished as the shadow and the thing itself which casts the shadow. And normally we know that when our shadow is cast, the shadow mimics us. It's our shape. So that means that our obedience mimics the body, mimics the believers. Mm-hmm. So we're going to do what we've been taught by the body, mm-hmm. the believers. In Mashiach, that's what. He, that's why Paul said it like this. Now, the ending part in particular is we have to understand when we see these words in our scriptures, and you read in the King James especially, you'll see that that is italicized, meaning it was added by the translators. And if you read this and you see the is, you know there was no reason or motivation to put that there but to cause confusion because they knew that this scripture was speaking of having the body of believers, the body of believers judge or make sure your obedience to Torah and the things in Torah are correctly adhered to. But when you put that body in, 
of Mashiach. It disconnects the association of, of judge, those who are obedient to Torah judging you and simply saying that the body is of Mashiach or the body is of the Messiah or father of the Messiah. It disconnects. So what you have to realize I'm looking at the English words in the English translation is does not belong. So the verse should read at the beginning, which are a shadow of I mean at the end, which are the shadow of things to come, but the but the body of Mas- of the of Mashiach. So Paul is simply saying here that no man should judge you with your obedience to all things in Torah, which are a shadow. Your obedience just is the shadow of the body that casts you. Meaning you're mimicking and doing what the body's doing. And therefore, only the body should judge you. And the body is the believers, the fellow believers, the fellow Torah believers, mm-hmm. the nations, the 12 tribes. Mm-hmm. That's what Paul is saying. Mm-hmm. So when the, when, when, the, when the Christian argument comes up and they love the scripture, now you can break it down. You can break it down. And I tell you, especially if you come to them and say, well, what does it mean, a shadow? What casts a shadow? And you tell them the body is the one that's a shadow, and if the body is up inside it, then the shadow is mimicking the body. And therefore, he's saying only the body should judge the person. Mm-hmm. And when you see that, that, there's really no argument to that. If they don't accept that, that means they just don't want to listen anyway. So are we, we're pretty much caught up, I believe, in that verse. Let me see. Or we can, well, one more slide. Let's go over one more slide, I believe. Yes, one more slide. So when you read this again, let's, let's reread this whole thing right here. So in the restated verses, right here at the bottom, uh, right below the verse, it says, Let no man judge you in food or drink or respect of holy days or of the new moon or the Shabbat, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body of Mashiach, which casts the shadow. In other words, they're showing you what to do anyway mm-hmm. because they know the Torah. You're not going to know. I'm sorry, but you can say all you want to talk about how much you love Yah- Yahusha and Yah. If you don't do what his word says, and he says it plainly, if you love me, you keep or obey my command. Mm-hmm. And if you understood what the word righteous meant, you understood that it was obedience to divine law. Divine law is Torah. So he was he didn't come here to separate that. That, that that's that's a whole nother argument in itself. So another way to say this, but no man judge your, your obedience to Torah, but those who are in Masha, mm-hmm. and that these acts of Torah are only a shadow of what will be coming anyway. Mm-hmm. On top of that, we know it's the shadow that's caught cast by the body. Now we also know, we also know because the argument is in the scriptures. All you got to do is read with the eyes to see that the obedience to Torah is everlasting. Mm-hmm. And the Shabbat will be, Shabbat is done in the Shamayim in heaven, and it will be done on earth. Mm-hmm. It's going nowhere. So you might as well get it right while you're here. You're going to have to get it right later. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So this verse has nothing to do with your ability to eat anything. Nothing. Nothing at all. Mm-hmm. Now, Anybody have any add any questions, any comments to this one? Mm. None, none so far. All right, all right. Well, we'll go to the, okay, good, thank you. So let's go to the next verse, and we'll have Brother Brother start us off with the reading. We'll do Mark 7, 1 through 3. Mark 7, verse one through three. Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain and certain of the scribes, which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of the disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say, 
with unwashing hands, they found fault for the Pharisees and all of Yahweh, except they washed their hand off, eat not holding tradition of the elders. Mm-hmm. When the reason why this is used by the church is because they'll take that last part, the tradition of the elders, see, mm-hmm. and say, see, the Messiah and his disciples did not care about the food balls at that time. They were ignoring them. <laughs> but first of all, what they were eating was clean. By the way, they won't mention that part. What he was actually eating was a clean food. It was a, it was, a, it was clean. So it wasn't that he was eating something dirty. But again, the church goes by their English standards and don't understand what tradition is meant mean, nor the historical context of scripture, which is very important because tradition was a big problem for the for the Hebrew mm-hmm. and many of the Pharisees and Sadducees who put the traditions of a man above the commandments of God. Mm-hmm. And Yahushua speaks to that in the Gospels mm-hmm. quite a bit. So with tradition, let's read through this. It's, it's paradosis, and it's the body of precepts. This is a, the Thayer's Concordance definition. The body of precepts, ritual, which, by the opinion of the latter Jews, I, put, mm-hmm. I purposely left that, mm-hmm. were orally delivered by Moshe. So this was the Talmud. An oral law created by Hebrews that led many, 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 many to sin because they would, it was a, um, how should I say, it was a very, very compromising law that allowed them to do circumvent God's law in many ways. And it was put above God's laws. Mm-hmm. And this was really propagated by many of the Pharisees. Who were not native, or not saying let me rephrase it. They were not, you know, gen- genetically, genealogically Hebrew. They were converts. Mm-hmm. Now they weren't necessarily the author of the oral laws, the oral traditions, and stuff. Mm-hmm. But they were the propagators. They really pushed it, and this was the criticism. They would wash their hands and pots and pans and everything else, thinking that 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 was part of keeping themselves clean internally. But when you look in Torah, when it comes to the dietary laws, when what we read earlier in lesson one and two, we didn't see any of that picture. Mm-hmm. The only time you had to wash a pot, and it really wasn't washed, is if a dead animal, an animal that died, fell on anything that you used. Yah said, put it in water, flowing water, like a river or, or something like that, and leave it there till evening. You left it there for a long time. Mm-hmm. And when you pull it out, it will be clean. Mm-hmm. If then will it be clean? So that was the only time. He didn't say you had to wash your hands or wash every pot before you touched it, before you consumed your meal. That was not Torah. That was the Talmud. Mm -hmm. And the Talmud was not of Yah. It Mm -hmm. was of man. Mm -hmm. Everybody follow with that one? Anybody want to add? Yes, we have a comment, please, or a question. Sure. So I just had a question about the Talmud. Was the Talmud not okay just because Mm -hmm. the man themselves, like, changed or altered the, the law? Can you re can you re-question that for me, Minister, so I can hear it clearly? Oh, clearly. sorry. Um, the Talmud, since it was an oral law that was created by the Hebrews, did it lead many to sin because it was changed throughout like the generations as it was being spoken to others? It, it, oh, good question. It led many to sin because not because it did change, but because it was never meant to really be. There was no need for it. Many times when the Talmud was created, for example, it was created out of being forced. And I think one of them, let's give an example. Yahushua speaks about divorce, right? Mm-hmm. When they brought about, when the Pharisees and Sadducees tried to trick Yahushua when they had a statement about divorce. He said that Mo, um, Moses was required to create 
divorce decree or just certificate or document out of the pressures of you because you wanted to separate yourself from your spouse. Mm -hmm. But he said quickly, right back, but that was never meant to be Mm -hmm. because once you are married, you are one flesh. So that was not Torah. But he was forced to do it because of the problems that the people were causing for him. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the Talmud was a convenient oral law that was not necessarily necessarily created by Moses. They would try to say it was Moses. Mm -hmm. But really, it was the leaders of the people that added all this. And it was passed down orally first. It was never written. And later on, through the Jewish community, now it's the Jews now, they're the ones that put it on paper. Not not the original Hebrews, not the true Hebrews. They did not write it. Mm -hmm. I also want to um, mention that when the laws were given to to um to Moses, when the discussion between the Most High and Moses was going on, those laws were penned. So how is it that we've gone from laws that were written, now we're back to something that's verbal? How did we end up with a verbal law or an oral law when it began with written law? So those those laws that are oral are clever ways to circumvent what the Most High has asked us to do. That's how they are. Wow. And, and, you, and you think of it, and that's true, that's correct. And if you think of it this way, there was, if an oral law would have done the job, there would have been no need for God to get Moses up there on that mountain and have him write it. Mm-hmm. He knew that the, he knew the oral law would have came about anyway. The oral law is nothing but a man's invention. And it's self righteousness. Mm-hmm. It has nothing to do with the true righteousness of Yah. Mm-hmm. If you are a keeper of the Talmud, you are most likely in sin mm-hmm. because it allows you to do what Minister White just said. You will circumvent Yah's command. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anybody else? I do have a quick question. Are you going to touch on verses six and seven in your next slide? Let's see, I got it. Yes, ma'am. Never yep. mind. We're Go going ahead. right to it. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be able to add as much as you want. <laughs> and I'm a, um, let's go to the next slide and we'll keep brother, brother reading for us in this section. Mm-hmm. Because, um, Mark 7, verse 4 through 6. <clears throat> and when they come from the market, except they wish, and they eat not, and many other things they, there be, which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels and of tables. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not the disciples according to the tradition of the elders? Mm. But he bred with unwashed hands. He answered and said unto them, Well, have you, Sias, prophesied of you hypocrites? As it is written, the people honor of me with their, their lips, but their heart is far from me. Mm-hmm. I don't have anything highlighted, but this actually fills in what we've already talked about. Mm-hmm. They were talking about, you know, wa- holding, washing of cups and pots and vessels and tables. A lot of the stuff you see we do every day. Right, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I understand why. If you think about it, I mean, I don't want to have to. If I have a dirty table, I like to clean. But mm-hmm. that is not what the files, not according to Yah, mm-hmm. because the, because the Torah, Torah is spiritual. Like right? Torah is spiritual. So he's asking them. You know, the Pharisees are asking them, why won't they do what the elders have taught tradition? And then he says to them. Hmm. Y'all are hypocrites. <laughs> mm-hmm. You honor me with your lips, your heart is far from me. And he'll look, and he's gonna go into it in the next slide. Okay. In the next slide. So anybody has everybody's following so far, right? Yes. Any we questions are. with that one? We're good. All right. All right, I'll pick on somebody else to read for me. Um mm-hmm. Sister Lily can move to read to us, please. You'll read 
the next, this one and the next slide as well. Okay. Thank you. Mark 7, 7 through 11. How be it in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, for laying aside the commandments of Elohim. Ye hold the traditions of men as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things ye do. And ye said unto them, Full well, ye reject the commandment of Elohim, that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moshe said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let them die the death. But ye say, If a man just shall say to his father or mother, It is Corbin, that it is to say a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by, me sh he shall be free. So here we go. Yahushua's putting them in their place. Mm -hmm. Right here, he goes, You know, how be it in vain do you worship me? He didn't say worship Yah, he said worship me. So he, he put himself where he's supposed to be, even when he corrects them. Mm -hmm. And he's telling them, <laughs> You teach the commandments of men, and you lay aside the commandments of Yah. Mm -hmm. And the church does this today. If you worship on Sunday, you do exactly this mm -hmm. because it's a tradition of the church to worship on Sunday and ignore the Sabbath. It's a tradition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a tradition. It's not scripture. It's mm -hmm. not law mm -hmm. because you lay the side of the and the way you hold your, the tradition of men as, let's say, worshiping on Sunday and many other such like things you do. Mm -hmm. Full well, ye reject the commandments of Elohim, that you may keep your own tradition. Mm -hmm. And they will fight to the nail to do it. They will, they will give you, you can ask them why they do this. And they should be able to give it to you in a brief statement. Because that's what's supporting the truth. That's how easy the truth is to communicate. But because this is not the truth for them, it will require an elaborate explanation. So I will tell you, if someone's got to explain their answer, then most likely the truth is not it. It should not take a paragraph or a presentation to answer one question when the scriptures clearly pointed out. And he gave an example about honoring your mother and father. Mm -hmm. But the Talmud will tell you, and this is so evil, think about it, that if the son came to his parents and said, yeah, I don't owe y'all nothing because the fact that I still live with you and tend to the farm and help deal with the crops or I bring in money to the house and you plop it off of it, you're, I'm free. I don't have any commitment to you. That's some evil nonsense. Mm -hmm. That's evil. That's selfish. Mm -hmm. Has nothing to do with the toil. Mm -hmm. Everybody follows? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Questions? Very close. No questions. All right. Let's move to the next one. And Sister Lily, continue, please. Mark 7, 12 to 15. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of Elohim of, no, of one effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. And when he had called all the people unto him, he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand. There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the men. Mm -hmm. This is one of the problems the church has. Mm -hmm. Right off the bat, they will quickly forget the cultural context of this situation. One, and up foremostly, they're arguing and disputing the importance of law, either Talmud or Torah. They're arguing. So that means they're adhering to it right off the bat. Secondly, you're talking about Hebrews. They don't eat pork. They're not eating anything physically unclean. In fact, this whole section of scriptures, we're talking about bread with dirty hands. Mm -hmm. So instead of Mahusha saying to them in some elaborate statement, 
it's not since we're eating bread, and I must make sure you understand we're eating bread here. We're talking about eating bread that comes in. He didn't have to say all that. It's an understood situation, the environment, the culture. It's understood. They're eating bread. They are talking about law. They are talking about tradition. And they're talking about adherence and obedience. So why would all of a sudden this statement here mean you don't need to be obedient. Mm-hmm. This is how the church teaches. Mm-hmm. It teaches you to ignore context, culture, audience, mm-hmm. circumstances. Mm-hmm. You should not, because if you do, you're forgetting, you will, you will miss all the things that should be assumed as well. Mm-hmm. So Yahusha reacts to the eating of the bread with unwashed hands, speaking of the Talmud. Mm -hmm. Yahusha speaks on how the Pharisees and Sadducees threw away the commandments of Elohim for the Talmud. This means Yahusha was not making a statement that would annul toward dietary law. Mm -hmm. Yahusha pointed out that bread didn't defile, but what came out of the person did, because what came out was not of Torah. Yahushua stated that they laid aside Torah. So that was the problem. That's the reason why it was defied. Because what came out of him, when it speaks like this, when it throws aside the truth, that is what defiled him. Mm-hmm. Because we know what Torah does. We have talked about this in the other lessons. It, 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 it is the life and light. And when you don't have that in its proper place, you don't have Torah where it should be. What else will come out of you? Because if Torah is not there, it is nothing but the foul. So Yahushua is not talking about throwing away dietary laws and whatever you eat. It doesn't matter. That's not true at all. Because think about this. Think about it this way. If you do eat anything, then you do disobey and throw aside the commandment of Elohim. Mm-hmm. You're doing exactly what he said, because you took your own command, your own rights, mm-hmm. and you put aside Yahuwah, and you ate, which defiled you because of what came out of you, your own righteousness, your own standards. So, no, Yahushua wasn't talking about throwing away the dietary laws with this one. This is a very popular, very, very popular. Mm -hmm. Any questions with this one? Anybody want to add something? I believe somebody's got something to add with this one. This is a a pretty serious one. I do. I'd like to um, add just one one observation. Being that most of us have come Mm -hmm. out of Christianity, we understand um, how we were taught that the latter part of this verse that I'm pointing to, it says, there is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. That phrase right there is what I was taught. See, it doesn't matter what you eat because it's not what you eat that defiles you. It's what comes out of you that defiles you. But what I'd like to say is let's put that, let's put that mindset to a test. Let's go and grab a puffer fish and eat it to see if it is true that whatever we eat doesn't defile us. It's only what comes out of us. Because anyone that understands what a puffer fish is know that it takes a special chef to prepare it a special way so that when you do eat it, it doesn't kill you. So that that mindset that it doesn't matter what goes into the body, because this is what this is the scripture that they use to to justify that, that goes out the window. When you put it to just a small test, say, let's try eating one thing, since it says it doesn't matter. Let's try eating this one thing to see if that idea, if that concept holds true, and it doesn't. It doesn't hold true at all. So we need to review. You know what else you can say, too? Yes, go ahead, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm 
sorry. Um, to add to that, alcohol. Believe it or not, according to science, alcohol is a poison to your body. And it takes the liver to metabolize it, to neutralize its impact on the body. That's why drinking too much destroys the liver over time. Mm -hmm. So you're telling me, if nothing defiles you, I can drink as much alcohol as I want. And two things should not happen. One, I shouldn't get drunk. And two, I shouldn't destroy my liver. Mm -hmm. Because nothing defiles me. Mm -hmm. The first thing someone will say was, you got to use common sense. Really? If common sense was doable for us, do you think Yahuwah would have to give us all these laws? Mm. You, you would have thought common sense would have told you to obey it. <laughs> <laughs> Common sense. Yes. I have a comment. The argument, <clears throat> yes, sir, one second. But the argument from against these scriptures, especially this one, mm -hmm. is so poor because the problem they have is that they will grab that piece of the verse and ignore the other 12 verses, 14 verses, and hold on to it, claiming that this is what it means. It's, it's very frustrating. Yes, brother. I'm going to state that um, it is very well known that people that follow this doctrine of Christianity will cherry pick scriptures and will do so not even know the full context of scriptures. Like, you ask a, <clears throat> you ask, I mean, you do a, uh, a poll on 10 people and you ask them, you ask 10 people what cut is. I guarantee you, six of them maybe won't know what cut is. Mm -hmm. And that that will that will that right there will let them know they know nothing of why you should be poor. Mm -hmm. And then some people will say, well, know it, well, hey, I went to Leviticus, I, I read that. Oh, we're at Leviticus, and what else did it say with it? They can't even answer that. <clears throat> so I mean, it's hard for people to understand dietary law when they don't understand the word of righteousness. They don't understand um, anything in aspects towards it. So it, it, I mean. Ignorance is a very big part of Christianity. The ignorance in there and there, the word petitioner, it, it means lack of their knowledge. When you don't have knowledge of a subject, you're very ignorant of it. And they don't know this because of, you're right, uh, Brother Andrew, it's not taught in church. Mm -hmm. it's, not ta not, it's not taught, taught in Christianity at all. And when it's not taught, it's not adhered to. Mm -hmm. Because to adhere to something, you have to have knowledge of it. Mm -hmm. Because so, I mean, that's, uh, because the mother of the modern church hated the law. The Roman mm -hmm. church did not, the early Roman church did not want anything to do. They called it, at that time, Judaizing. Mm -hmm. And they thought it when they got ugly and we should separate the Christian church, separate it. I mean, they hated it. They hated it. That runs hand in hand with, with Edom. Edom, Esau's kingdom does not like anything Torah. He does not like it. Uh, he does not like a Sharel or God himself. No, Edom, to be, to, to be, to just show you how far back Edom disobedience, disobedience goes, Esau, as soon as he was old enough to disobey, he did when he married those Canaanite women. Mm -hmm. It starts that early. And those Canaanite women throw his mother nuts because they were pagan and mm -hmm. constantly doing it. Mm -hmm. So, start that early in, in, their, mm -hmm. in their history. Now, we can say all day what they want, to, what we know is true. But we know that also we need to grow a couple of desks to help remove the veil because I have I have had these conversations with many people, not to argue with them, but to get them to talk, and they would be emotionally upset at me. They would be upset because I will point things out to them that don't make sense, and they can't explain it. Mm -hmm. And one of my most recent ones, which is my favorite one right now today, is someone told me he, that Yahushua came to fulfill the law, which was in Matthew 5. But the same word fulfill he used in Matthew chapter 3 when he told John the Baptist, Yahukanah, to baptize him to fulfill righteousness. So I told him, I said, if you think fulfilling 
the law ended the law, then did he end righteousness? Because it's the same exact Greek word and English word. Mm -hmm. And he won't reply. He won't talk to me about it. Because (laughs) you can't explain it. You can't explain it. And I didn't go looking for that. I didn't have to ask nobody. I just happened to be reading and I noticed. Hold on. Why are you going to say he feels righteousness here? And he should feel Torah and we know Righteousness has not disappeared. So if those those if they argue, if they can argue their points, they would. But the problem that most people that have in Christianity, I was just like them. I argued my points based upon doctrine and theology, traditions of man, and not scripture at all. Not at all. Not at all. Mm-hmm. I didn't start understanding how bad I was until the truth came to me. Mm-hmm. Anybody else want to add? We're good on Mark. Mark, I think uh, I think we're pretty clear. Anybody? Are we good on that one? I'd like to add one more thing. <laughs> one more thing, please. It has to do with when yeah. they um, when you try to introduce this information to them, they'll say, "Well, we need to have um, common sense." When you hear that phrase, that phrase common sense is, you can, you can call it a rule, a rule for them where whatever it is that has been said in the Torah that they don't like, you can apply common sense to it and then massage it to suit your desire. That word, that phrase common sense means we're about to disobey, but we're doing it because we're reasoning. This is what that word, that phrase common sense means. Let's use common sense now about the food laws. We know that we can't, we know that we should not eat um, poison, poison fish and poison, poison frogs. That's common sense, but we can't eat the other unclean things. So let's use our common sense to circumvent the, um, the rules that, that Yah has given us. So when you hear that phrase, you know that they're about to tell you, something to do something that that's going to require you to disobey the laws of law because it's not written anywhere where Yah says these are my laws and please apply them accordingly according to your understanding not to the way they're written but the, according to the way that you understand them or according to the way um that they fit into society today where you can where you can massage them or cause them to fit into into your your own um, will of how you want to do it. It makes sense what I'm trying to say to you. Mm-hmm. So when you hear them say, "Let's use common sense," then you know that they're about to ask you to to, um, to negotiate the truth, and that's the point that I want I want to make that we should not do that. Right? They're using, they're using their own problem. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, they're using their own problems. One hundred percent agree. Well, Minister White, you can go ahead and read this one for us. This is a good one. This one right here is one of the home runs. We're gonna, we're gonna put put this one down. We're gonna catch this ball. Go ahead and read this for us. Please. Okay, one Timothy chapter four verse verses one through five. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats, which Elohim hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of Elohim is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of Elohim and prayer. <laughs> this right here, they will hold their whole argument to the point right here. Mm-hmm. This verse, they don't really need anything else. They want to argue. They'll argue off of this, these verses here alone. Alone. But let's see how purposeful those translations are. So you can, so you can see how this was done by the early church 
so they wouldn't have to stop eating their pork and mm-hmm. rabbit and raccoon and whatever else they eat. <laughs> mm-hmm. Because we know that the pagan church, <laughs> the, the, the founders of the pagan church, the heathens, uh, ate everything. They ate everything. Mm-hmm. And they didn't want to give up some of their most precious animals. Some mm-hmm. countries ate m- more, for example, just, just for some historical context. The pork, the pig was extremely popular in the Roman Empire. Extreme. It was a symbol for them. It was a delicacy. Mm-hmm. You go to different parts of Europe, that wasn't the case because it wasn't so easily available. You go to Ireland, for example, and it was the rabbit. The rabbit was very popular. Mm. You go to different parts of Africa, and bush meat is very popular. From monkey to, to rats, large, large rodents, everything else. Mm-hmm. Certain regions had their own certain meats and certain foods that they were used to. And of course, the early church didn't want to give it up. So they took these verses and really, really um, screwed them up. All right, so let's start talking about this. We have a lot to talk about on this one. Mm-hmm. So abstain is a pecome. May he or you pick a maiden, and it's to hold oneself off or abstain from anything. So when he says the commanding to abstain from meat, it was from foods in general. So you'll see people who would actually do starvations or extreme dieting or extreme choices, meaning they would leave meat alone or be a vegan or a vegetarian, for example, which is not a commandment. It's just not something that God wanted you to do. Now, he wants us to fast and pray, of course, but to abstain totally from most foods at all? No, he created them for our enjoyment. Mm-hmm. Because if it wasn't that way, it wouldn't be so doggone good. Mm-hmm. If he didn't have a purpose behind it, and that's what's wonderful about it. He didn't just create food, but he created a wonderful complexity to it that we could enjoy it as well. And you see that in the scriptures all the time where he says it's even the cooking of it, when you sacrifice and burn it, it's a smell that he enjoys. So if that's the case, you know good and well he's made it to where we can enjoy it as well. So that's something he was saying. That's not good to do that. Mm-hmm. All right? Anybody want to add any more? We're going to move to the next slide. Once, if nobody has anything to add, we can talk further on these verses. All right? So... Let's look at the word meat. That which is eaten, which is the Thayer's definition. But here, looking at the strong, so you can understand the context that Paul was talking about. Food, especially articles allowed or forbidden by Torah. So he was still speaking of Torah. Mm-hmm. And to Paul, food was only what was allowable to eat. Mm-hmm. That's what that is referencing. And Yahuwah created food to be received, to, to be enjoyed. But not all animals are food again. The only only thing that's considered food to the Hebrew is what is allowable to eat. Mm-hmm. So if you brought, um, like you said, a puffer fish, that's not food to me at all. Just because it's a living animal it doesn't make it food. Mm-hmm. According to the heathen, anything that's alive is game. <laughs> but according to Yah, only certain animals were designed for our consumption. Mm-hmm. The same thing with insects. All right. Mm-hmm. Now he said in that verse, he said to abstain from meat which Elohim has created to be received with thanksgiving. So we just spoke about what we what. It's considered food according to Torah to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know what? The truth. And the truth is Aletheia or Aletheia, the embodiment of which the Hebrews sought in the Torah. The law. Mm -hmm. The law is the truth. The Torah is the truth. Mm -hmm. That is the lexicon. There's the lexicon, the lexicon definition. So that means Paul is saying that they would receive the food, what is considered food, in accordance to what Yah has said in his Torah. So again, it's pointing to obedience. Mm-hmm. 
so far, the church is losing this battle in these verses. Mm-hmm. But the big argument is about to come up on the next slide. Is no one has anything else to add? No. All right. Let's let's talk about meat uh, creatures now. So the verse says. I'm going to just recap this section of the verse. For every creature of Elohim is good and nothing to be refused. Mm-hmm. But you can't, so you can't refuse any little creature. That means if a little puppy comes and I'm hungry enough, that little puppy going to be a good meal as long as I receive it in Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. For it is sanctified by the word of Elohim and prayer. And mm-hmm. that don't make sense. That don't make sense. It sounds contradictory. So let's look at the word creature, which is the tisma, and it's a thing founded, a created thing. Hold on. I thought a creature was an animal. Hmm. That doesn't sound like an animal, does it? Hmm. Something founded, something created, a created thing. Mm-hmm. But you need to look at the root, tisma. I mean, Ketizo, I'm sorry, to make habitable to people. Mm -hmm. So the thing that was made for people or founded for people, that's what a creature is. And according to Torah, what was founded for human consumption? What was that? The split Mm -hmm. hook, chew the cat. Correct? Yes. Fish with scales and things. The locust, the cricket, the wound, and the ant leg above the foot, and hops. The turkey, the chicken, and so on. Those were the things that were made for people or founded for people. So Paul, let's let me read this bullet. So so far, Paul states that people will abstain from foods that were created, and that we should receive these foods with thanksgiving, with the knowledge of the truth, Torah. And according to the Torah, the things that were made for his people are good. They are good. He made them. He told you what to get and eat. It shouldn't be refused. You don't refuse what he's established as good to eat, especially when you receive it with thanksgiving, of course, because everything is a gift. Is everybody following so far? Yes. That is a big, big deal. That word creature, people assume it's all the animals and stuff. It shouldn't even be the word creature. That is so misleading. That is such a lie. Yeah, I'm kidding, misleading. That's a lie. That translation was a lie. You did not have to put that word creature because they could have easily put created. And then maybe that would have at least got you to the right spot. But that word creature makes you think every little thing, every little animal, every animal. But when you look at the definition, it says things found in created things. And when you look at the root, to make habitable, to the people or two people. <laughs> no, that's not, you're not going to get us with that. Mm-hmm. Everybody follow? Uh, I have a question. Is sure. It, do you think it's possible that the, that the word creature there can refer to individuals, to people? I know when I read this, I would have never thought that. Well, I'm asking because what? in Second Corinthians chapter five, verse seventeen, I'm seeing um, some similarity, or actually a comparison. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse seventeen. Um, it says, "Therefore, if any man be in Hamashiach, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Um, behold, all things are become new." So when you when you when you look at this when the the way they're using it in First Timothy, you 
you wouldn't you wouldn't grab that idea and think that this creature that's being referred to could possibly be a human being as well. If you go by English standards, you you wouldn't because the word in that. I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. I'm sorry. Yes. Go ahead. If you if you look at the word used there, they're not the same Greek word, but it's translated the same. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it, but it serves a better. The word creature does serve a better understanding there. It it can work there. It doesn't work here. Mm-hmm. But there, it could have said something like this. Therefore, if any man be in Christ or in Mashiach. He is a new formation, mm-hmm. a new creation, mm-hmm. a new building, a new ordinance. They mm-hmm. could have said that. Mm-hmm. But they used the word, word creature as a living, breathing animal of some sort. So you're right. It could be assumed if you if you go by what that that, that is another very popular verse, right? Mm-hmm. But they're actually, as we see many times in, in the English translations, you'll see the same word for multiple different Greek words. And one of the most popular is, is Gentile. Uh-huh. We'll see that for ethnos. Mm-hmm. We'll see it for Helen. For Helen. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's another word I see it for. And then you look at Gentile in the Hebrew, it's for boy or boy. So mm-hmm. you have three or four different words in the, at least in the scriptures used for the word Gentile in in English. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's very common for English to do this. Very, very common. Mm -hmm. We can't depend on what we've been given. If you want to know the truth, if you really are a lover of Mashiach, of our Messiah, let's say you don't agree. Let's say you don't agree with us. But you say you do love him. Mm-hmm. Then the only challenge I give to any of anybody that listens to this is if you do love him, seek the truth. That's all you need to do. If you truly love him, always seek the truth. Mm-hmm. Then maybe you'll see what you think. You, you'll see what you don't realize you never saw. <laughs> mm-hmm. You never saw the truth. Still under the church, the traditions of the church, you don't have the truth. But if you seek the truth, you, your mind will be wrong. This is coming from someone who was raised in this and was very devout in the Christian church. Church of God in Christ and apostles of God. <laughs> very, very devout. All right. Anybody else got anything to add? No. All right, let's uh, let's continue with Timothy, First Timothy four one through five. We're going to talk about sanctify here because, <clears throat> excuse me, because he says, for every creature of Elohim well, is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified, right, by the word of Elohim and prayer. And sanctify is to purify Levitically. Really? So sanctify has something to do with the law. So if Paul was saying everything was good to eat, then how could you sanctify it Levitically through the law when we already covered in part one and two what Torah said about what could be eaten? Mm-hmm. See? There's too many contradictions in this. And it's... Oh, that's a typo. I'm sorry. That little part right there below from the the, um, Katizo to May Capital to people. Mm -hmm. I meant to remove that, so I apologize. We can ignore that bullet. (laughs) Okay. So let's go to Word. We'll go take a look at Word because he said it is sanctified by the Word of Elohim. Mm -hmm. And here is the definition in prayer in which the original testament is employed mm-hmm. and we know what's in the original Torah mm-hmm. Torah because the word this, this is another part 
Minister White, here's another piece of great scripture to prove where the disciples taught from and Yahushua taught from. Because it's telling you right here that the word was the Old Testament. Because we know during Paul's life, there was no new. So how can he say, anybody say that there was no law when that's the only thing they could teach from? Mm -hmm. This verse supports that. That is so true. That is so true. All right, everybody following with that one? Mm -hmm. They don't. They don't see the. They don't see the. the um, the Bible is bring is being in sections. It's still one book. Um, as they commonly say, sixty six books is really more than that. But it's sixty six books right now, um, because they've removed a f quite a few of the the ancient or apocrypha books that were once upon a time included. But they don't see the the right. the, um, the, the the Bible in sections. They don't see. The Torah, the books that are that are Torah, then then the prophets um, section, and then the writings, right? That make up the whole Old Testament. They don't they don't look at it that way. They only look at um, the the church. At least that's the way I was brought up. We look at what we called New Testament. We called it the New Testament. We didn't go. We didn't go beyond more. Um, <laughs> We didn't go past Malachi. We stopped at Malachi going back to Genesis. We didn't really we didn't really study that. It was from Matthew going forward to Revelation because we were told that all of that is the new stuff. We were never taught that the disciples, the apostles actually taught from the old from the Old Testament. We weren't told that. We weren't taught that. No, never. <clears throat> never taught that. And when you ask a Christian what 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 is the word? They will tell you. Oh, it's the um, the word contains. I'll ask them what when they say. If I told you the word of God, if I asked you that, what books are those? They would say Genesis to Revelation. Mm -hmm. Then, if you ask them, what does Paul mean when he says the word of God? They will say Genesis to Revelation. <laughs> They are not realized that the whole renewed covenant or New Testament, as they were called, never existed during the whole lifetime, the whole lifetime of the apostles. They did a lot of the writings, but they weren't put together until many, many, many years after their death. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the teaching that they taught were strictly from Genesis and Malachi and some of the stuff that was removed, like you said, by the early church mm -hmm. and removed for many reasons. That's a whole nother lesson if you really want to know that. That's some serious history. Moved for many reasons. But the, the point is, when they mention the word, like when Yahushua said that man should live by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of Yah, mm -hmm. you're going to forget that part when he says he that he didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Mm -hmm. He said that after he just said that man should live by every word. Every word is all of the Torah, mm -hmm. all of the prophet books, all of the wisdom books, mm -hmm. all of it. So how can you tell me he's destroyed it when he's already you're telling me he's contradicting so he just said live by it all mm -hmm. he told Satan that mm -hmm. he's telling someone who already knows that mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, there's some contradictions that they don't want to listen to you can mention that to him mention that to anyone in the church what did Yahushua mean he said you should live by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of Yah where is that word located and they will say the Bible. Okay, wonderful. Do you do that? And the first thing they're going to make an excuse that no one can. Mm -hmm. But that's not what Scripture said. Scripture, Yehusha said it himself. When he forgave the sins of the woman, he said, sin no more. That's what he said. So, I'm sorry, that was a tangent. But the point is, the whole word that was taught is all old. The, all the old stuff, all the original, 
Mm-hmm. That's what we're supposed to live by. Mm-hmm. So, anyway, um, yep. yes, the caveat on top of that is if they say no one can keep the law, well, my, my question would be do you go to work Monday through Friday or whatever your work hours are, mm. weekend or whatever? And they're going to say, yeah, do you do your job perfectly every day? You go. You never make a mistake. You never make a mistake on your job ever. And they're going to say, well, I'm sure I made one every now and then, but you still go, right? Mm-hmm. Good point. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so the point is, it's not, you have to learn how to keep touring. You have to learn how to jump rope. You have to learn how to ride your bike. You have to learn how to keep touring by walking it out. So if you never okay. begin the journey, then you'll never become perfect at it. It's not something he expects you to become perfect at overnight. Mm-hmm. You can become perfect or almost perfect because you're not perfect at your job. It took time. You had to learn it. You had to practice it. You had to go to training. It's the same thing with touring. You have to learn it. You have to practice it over and over again. And every, every time you practice it over and over again, you, you become better at it and better at it. It becomes easier to do. It's easier to do. Mm-hmm. It does. So how are you, how, Excellent point. Yes. Yeah, so how are you purified? If to sanctify, sanctification means salvation. So how are you sanctified if you're not keeping Torah? Because it said to be purified by what stays in Torah. If you're not keeping Torah, then how then are you sanctified? Hmm. You're not. You're not. No. But According to the scripture, you're not. According to the scripture, you're not. Mm-hmm. I have, I can't tell you how many times this run countless times I have been told in my church you must be told holy is sanctified you must be sanctified you must be sanctified but guess what they never really taught you how hmm. no, they never they taught, taught you what makes you sanctified what makes you holy they don't teach us that. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the reason why I grew in such great frustrations with my walk in church because stuff was not making sense to me. Yah would not allow me to be comfortable in it. I bust my head constantly in the church for years. And I would go in and out, leave it alone, come back, leave it alone, come back. We won't come back thinking maybe it was me and my approach to things. When in fact, it was me not understanding why all this stuff was going on. It didn't make sense until the truth was given to me. And man, all my, and all my, my concerns were answered. It was a great fear for me to leave the church. A great fear. I was very scared to do it. I didn't want to be condemned for doing something I was wrong to do. But when I realized what was wrong, it was staying in that situation. And that this, that Torah, God's law, is what matters most. It took a long time. So it, I don't take this lightly. And it's, you know, people would hear this, this lesson and be like, man, they're bashing. I'm not bashing the church, but I am critical. Right. I think Yah, for what I learned fundamentally, but in many aspects, it made my life hard because it taught me so many wrongs. So many wrongs. And it does it daily. It does it daily and it continues. Mm-hmm. All right. Anybody else have anything? We'll go ahead and wrap up Timothy, First Timothy on the next slide. Okay. All right. So let's, let's put it together. In the latter times, this is Paul, what Paul was really saying. Some shall depart from believing and being obedient to Torah. That's faith. That's what faith really means. Paul states that people will abstain from foods Yahuwah created for man to eat, mm-hmm. for us to eat, and that we should receive these foods with thanksgiving, with the knowledge of the truth, of what we know in Torah, right? And according to the Torah, 
is that were made for his people are good and shouldn't be refused and received with thanksgiving. I mean, I mean, come on, people. He gives us everything. We should always be thankful. For it is sanctified, purified, permissible by the biblical law, by the original testament, the Torah, God's word, and prayer. And prayer. So Paul was literally speaking of Torah, what's acceptable according to Torah, and that what Yah has created for his people as food and whatever else according to Torah is acceptable and should be accepted with with um or received with thanksgiving and appreciation to Yah. That's what Paul was saying in verse 2 before. Not food. <laughs> not not just eat anything, because every little creature's great. I'm gonna go get me a dark frog on a stick and see how, how great I do after I eat that. I'm gonna pray it, but I'm gonna pray over it first. <laughs> you believe it. Give me a poison dark frog. <laughs> That's that doesn't make sense. No. All right, anybody else wanna add anything? No. Um, I do want to say one other thing. It seems like the tradition of man has become the Torah of the law. And the Torah of the law has become the traditions of man. Mm-hmm. I like that. That's that's good. Yeah. yeah. Because they have put the traditions of man above the Torah of the law, which means their traditions have become their Torah. Mm-hmm. So when you say you do not live by the Torah because it's too difficult, you do live by the traditions that's not too difficult. So mm-hmm. you do follow something. Mm-hmm. You go to church on Sunday. You celebrate your Christmas every year. You celebrate your Easter every year. Mm-hmm. You celebrate your Halloween every year. You celebrate your Thanksgiving every year. And you even at Bible study on Wednesday night. <laughs> 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 so you have uh, Tuesday uh, and Friday, Tuesday, Friday, Saturday morning. I mean, Sunday morning and Sunday night. I was at the church mm-hmm. four days a week. <laughs> See that? And still don't know what it is. Keep one law. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> You know, you have a deal. I had a zeal for this and didn't know what I wanted, didn't know what I was really looking for. Even when it was first presented to me, I didn't believe it because I wanted to judge it according to my Talmud, my own Talmud, my own doctrine that I was taught. It took me knocking my head against the wall for 10, 15 years for me to finally stop looking at my own Talmud and go look for the truth, really look for the truth when the truth was delivered. And what, what I found made me fall on my knees and repent, truly repent. That's what the resulting of truth will do to you. All right, let's, uh, let's summarize this section up on the next slide. All right, so we will say then, and we already touched on some of this, that Paul spoke of what Yahuwah considered food according to Torah. And Paul's prayer of the food was in accordance with Levitical law, Torah. And creature was not a reference to animals, which is a purposeful misleading translation. That was purposely done because they could have easily used a different word because, in fact, the Greek word that was used in there differed from the... um, 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 verse that Minister White gave. Two different words, but they use creature for both. That's, mm-hmm. That proves there was a choice to do that. Paul referenced faith, truth, and the word. All three are connected to obedience to Torah. So the only food spoken of in these verses that could be prayed and thanked for is what is considered food by Yah in Torah in the first place. Mm-hmm. So this scripture was all about obedience to Torah. Mm-hmm. 
Everybody agrees with that? Anybody got anything you want to add with that? No. All right. This was a shorter section, part four. We're going to end it here. Um, we're going to pick up in part five. We're going to continue to uh, talk about the consequences of disobeying Yah's dietary law. That will be the next section. So we thank you so much for joining us, part four of the dietary laws. And we look forward to you in part five. Shabbat shalom to those who are present. Shabbat shalom to all of you who are live online with us right now. And Shabbat shalom to those of you who will watch this video in the near future.